whether it be Europe, America, or anywhere else besides Antarctica really. Before the Younger Dryas mass extinction event, the world looked a very different place. Up until approximately 10,000 BC, completely different ecosystems existed with flora and fauna that does not exist today. That such an event could change our environment so swiftly has always fascinated me. How Mother Nature can recover and build new food webs and eventually lead to the ecosystems that we're familiar with today is nothing short of miraculous. The striking difference between the animals we now share the planet with and the ones that unfortunately could not survive past this event was their size. What we now refer to as Ice Age megafauna most of the time dwarfs their modern cousins. Of course, their size may have been their undoing. I have made a previous video concerning the lesser known of these giant animals, and today I would like to give some more a well-deserved spotlight. So without further ado, let's get into it. This giant Irish deer is believed to have roamed the lowlands of central and eastern Ireland. Adult pre-rut stags weighed over one ton, whereas the hinds weighed about half a ton. The stags and hinds display similar levels of sexual dimorphism, which means the difference between adult males and females in terms of overall body size, as their direct living relatives, the fallow deer do. Both the stags and the hinds stood at about 1.8 meters at the shoulders, but only the stags bore antlers with a width of up to 4 meters and a combined weight of up to 45 kilograms. These are the largest antlers known to have existed on any Old World deer species. They were palm-like antlers, similar to those of the fallow deer, its nearest living direct descendant. This giant Irish deer was present in Ireland before and after the last Great Ice Age. However, as the climate warmed after the retreat of the last big glaciers of the last Ice Age, the vegetation in Ireland consisted of phases of grasses and sorrels, juniper and least willow about 13 to 12,500 years before present. This vegetation dominated the grasslands, heat and open country of Ireland, as evidenced from the pollen records. This was prime grazing food for the giant deer, but there was rapid cooling which occurred at about 12 to 11,000 years before present, which led to a re-advancement of the glaciers in certain areas of Ireland. The change to Arctic-like climatic conditions led to significant and rapid change in the vegetation, resulting in open, tundra-like conditions. The Irish elk could not adapt at the same pace of the changing vegetation and could not migrate from Ireland elsewhere, as Ireland was an island. Thus, localised extinction occurred in Ireland with the majority of the giant deer fossil bones dating to 12,150 to 10,600 years before present. After a gestation or pregnancy length of approximately 36 weeks, adult hinds would have separated from the main female herd to give birth, perhaps in the small copses of forests that were found in Ireland and this habitat would have provided protection and security for both the mother and the offspring. The calf would have weighed approximately 29 kg, just a little bit smaller than an adult female Sika deer. Wolves, which were present in Ireland during this time, would have posed a threat to the young calf and solitary female, akin to present day adult solitary female moose and their calves. Timing and location of calving sites would have been very important against such predation. There is no direct evidence that the giant deer gave birth to twin calves, although it's not impossible. For example, of comparable size, female moose, in excellent physical condition, will give birth to twins, each weighing approximately 15 kg. 
Even though they are known as Irish elk, they are not elk, and also fossils have been found in such countries as France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Britain, Scandinavia, Italy, and even Central Asia. However, the best collection of fossils can be found at the National Museum of Ireland, where there are 10 complete deer skeletons and over 400 partial remains, which include 6 females. There have been many fossil finds throughout Ireland, with the most famous being Ballybetta Bog, Glencullen, County Dublin, where over 100 deer skeletons were found. Other sites are Hout, County Dublin, and Loch Gur, County Limerick. These fossils have been mainly found in peat bogs and in old lakes, with some older fossils even being found in caves. Argentivus, also known as the giant pteratorn, was a species of giant predatory bird that lived during the late Miocene epoch in South America. It is considered one of the largest flying birds to have ever existed with a wingspan estimated to be around 6 to 8 metres. The name Argentifus is derived from the Latin words Argentum meaning silver and Avis meaning bird, referring to its impressive size and stature. Argentifus belonged to the family Teratondidae, a group of large, long-winged birds of prey that were known for their soaring capabilities. These birds were adapted for gliding over long distances, using air currents and terminals to stay aloft with minimal effort. Argentifus likely relied on its large wingspan and efficient gliding capabilities to cover vast distances in search of prey. Argentifus' territories measured probably more than 500 square kilometers, which the birds screened for food, possibly utilizing a generally north-south direction to avoid being slowed by adverse winds. This species seems less aerodynamically suited for predation than its relatives. It probably preferred to scavenge for carrion, and it's possible that it habitually chased carnivores such as Thylacosimilidae from their kills. The largest land predators in Miocene South America were the giant ground-dwelling terror birds. Terror birds were probably the most formidable rivals that Argentivus faced, with the largest species weighing about three times as much as the pteratorn. Unlike extant condors and vultures, pteratorns generally had long, eagle-like beaks and were believed to have been active predators. This is seemingly true as well of Argentivus, but other pteratorns were likely far less ponderous considering the substantial size differences between them and Argentivus. Argentivus may have used its wings and size to intimidate mammals and other smaller creatures from their kills. Argentivus may have also ambushed some small live prey, such as large rodents, small armadillos, and the young of large animals such as ground slots. The species would have required about 2.5 to 5 kg of meat each day. When hunting actively, Argentivus would have probably swooped down from high above onto their prey, which they usually would have been able to grab the prey by its bill, kill and swallow without even landing. However, they may have too lain in wait from a ground position, which would render them likely grounded until heavy winds allowed them to fly. Skull structure suggests that it ate most of its prey whole rather than tearing off pieces of its flesh. In comparison with extant birds, it suggests it laid one or two eggs with the mass somewhat over one kg. By comparison, this is smaller than an ostrich egg. It would have laid these eggs around once every two years. Climate considerations make it likely that the birds incubated over the winter, mates exchanging duties of incubating and procuring food every few days, and the young were independent after some 16 months, but not fully mature until aged about a dozen years. Mortality must have been very low. To maintain a viable population, less than about 2% of birds may have died each year. Because of its large size and ability to fly, 
Argentavis suffered hardly any predation, and mortality was mainly from old age or disease. The extinction of Argentavis is thought to have been linked to changing environmental conditions and competition with other predators. As the climate shifted and ecosystems changed, the availability of suitable prey may have decreased, putting pressure on large predators like Argentavis. A super predator once inhabited Europe, Asia and Africa, the giant short-faced hyena. It stood about 90 to 100 centimetres at the shoulder and it is estimated to have averaged 110 kg in weight, approaching the size of a lioness, making it the largest known hyena. Found in Europe from around 2 million years ago, it was one of the most fearsome predators faced by the first hominin populations who ventured out of Africa. Although the hyena's direct role as an ecological competitor of Pleistocene hominins is often overemphasized, they were nonetheless a unique component of the fauna encountered by these populations. A cache of very comprehensive bone material was unearthed in the famous Zugadian cave site in northern China which probably represents the remains of animals using these caves as lairs for many millennia. At the western end of their former range, at Venta Mycena in southeastern Spain, a huge assemblage of Pleistocene fossils also represents a den. Yet another example exists in the Pabi Hills of Pakistan, where remains of animals scavenged or killed by the giant shore-faced hyena were accumulated. Similar to the modern-day striped hyena, the short-faced hyena is often suggested to have been a kleptoparasitic scavenger of the kills of other predators, such as the saber-toothed cats and other large carnivores of the time. The giant hyena scavenged for food, probably preferentially so, because it was a heavy-set animal not built for chasing prey over long distances. In this respect, it would have differed from the spotted hyena of today, which is a more nimble animal that contrary to its image as a scavenger, usually kills its own food, but often gets displaced by lions. Research by anthropologists Noel Boas and Russell Chicken on remains of Homo erectus unearthed alongside the giant hyena at the Zudikin site attributed scoring and puncture patterns observed on hominin long bones and skulls originally thought to be signs of cannibalism to predation by the giant hyena. Hyenas are commonly known for the ability to break bones and feed on their contents, and the giant hyena was well adapted to this feeding habit. They were also capable of accumulating bones, as evidenced by some sites discovered by paleontologists. During the Pleistocene, Hominins were the only other group capable of exploiting the content of bones as a food source, using lytic tools to break them. For this reason, the possible competition of these populations with the giant hyena is one of the great interests to researchers today. However, the reason why the species became extinct and the timing of this event in Europe has long been shrouded in mystery. A new study carried out by a group of researchers from the Sipienza Department of Earth Scientists and published in the Journal of Quaternary Science Reviews has re-evaluated giant hyena fossils and other hyenas spread across Europe in the Pleistocene. This has revealed that the giant short-faced hyena disappeared from Europe around 800,000 years ago, probably as a result of climatic and environmental changes and not due to competition with other species that spread during the same period. Although once widespread across the continent, the giant hyena was unable to cope with the climatic and environmental changes that occurred in the so-called early to middle Pleistocene transition. This period saw an increase in the amplitude and fluctuations between glacial and interglacial intervals at the beginning of the Ice Age. The replacement between the giant hyena and other hyenas was one of the most characteristic events of fauna renewal at the time. Several specialised carnivores, such as saber-toothed cats, 
declined or became extinct, while new and more adaptable species spread. These include lineages of modern fallow and red deer, wild boars, wolves, also human populations. The giant beaver is an extinct rodent that lived in North America between 1.4 million and 10,000 years ago. It was a distant cousin to modern beavers, but in many ways may have been more similar to modern capybaras. The giant beaver was one of the largest rodents ever to roam the earth, and one of approximately 30 extinct genera of beavers. Only two beaver species survive today, the North American beaver and the Eurasian beaver. The giant beaver received its scientific name, Castoroides ohioensis, after remains of it were found in 1837 in Ohio. In Canada, giant beaver fossils have been found on Indian Island, New Brunswick, in Toronto, and near Highgate, Ontario. And in Old Crow Basin, Yukon. They live in the oral history of many indigenous peoples, including the Innu, Seneca, Eastern Cree, Chippewa, and Ventus Gwich'in. In addition to the giant beaver, another similar species lived during the same time period, C. Dilophytus. The former mostly lived in southern Canada and the southern United States but sometimes as far northwest as Yukon and Alaska. The latter was confined to the southeastern United States. Despite what their name suggests, giant beavers are not closely related to modern beavers. The last ancestor that had in common lived about 20 million years ago. Giant beavers could grow to more than 2 meters long, not including their tail, and could weigh in excess of 100 kg. For comparison, modern beavers grow as long as 1.3 meters, but that's with the tail included. The giant beaver's tail could reach 65 centimeters long, but was proportionately narrower than the modern beavers. With large hind feet, but short limbs overall, they were more adapted to aquatic life than movement on land. Their front teeth had blunt tips, prominent ridges along their outer surface, and could grow up to 15 centimeters long. Studies also show that giant beaver brains were proportionately smaller and smoother than those of modern beavers. This suggests they may not have been as capable at complex tasks. Scans have revealed a cavity in the giant beaver's skull that may have been used to produce sounds. While modern beavers also make noises, they do not have the same skeletal cavity. Little is known about the other giant beaver behaviours, such as social and mating habits. Researchers are still uncertain about the giant beaver's diet and lifestyle. Some think it ate aquatic plants almost exclusively and did not build dams or lodges. Others believe it ate mostly terrestrial plants and did build such structures. Although the location of fossils shows the giant beaver preferred aquatic habitats, there is little evidence to suggest engineering behaviour similar to modern beavers. For example, the angle of the giant beaver's front teeth does not seem adapted to tree cutting. Similarly, while branches have been found near giant beaver fossils before, there is disagreement as to whether their extremities match the shape of giant beaver's front teeth. Chemical and isotopic analysis of fossils have shown no sign of wood in the giant beaver's diet. However, these analyses do not exclude dam building entirely. Despite inconclusive evidence, tree harvesting has occurred in certain branches of the beaver family since the Miocene epoch which was 23 to 5.3 million years ago, and a lodge that may have been built by giant beavers was found in Ohio in 1912. Whether giant beavers were the builders or not remains an open question. The most recent fossils found show that giant beavers went extinct towards the end of the Pleistocene epoch, about 10,000 years ago. While scientists aren't sure what caused their extinction, 
it is almost certainly related to the changing climatic conditions in that period, when many megafauna species went extinct. The wetlands in which giant beavers lived began to dry up, starting in the southern part of their range. Because they may not have been able to modify their environment like the modern beaver would, they were forced to move north. However, their bodies were poorly adapted to land travel, and many struggled to relocate. Other studies suggest a mix of causes leading to the giant beaver's extinction were different. For example, the changing climate also shifted the timing of precipitation, which may have hampered the growth of the plants giant beavers ate. Other factors, such as increased competition for food with other semi-aquatic rodents, may have also played a role. Camelops is an extinct genus of camels that lived in the western North America in the middle Pliocene to the end of the Pleistocene. It shares a common ancestor with the Old World, Dromedary and Bactrian camel, making it a true camel, as well as a more distant common ancestor with the New World Alpaca, Llama and Vicuna. The genus Camelops first appeared during the middle Pliocene about 4 to 3.2 million years ago in southern North America and became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, around 10,000 years ago. Despite the fact that camels are popularly associated with the deserts of Asia and Africa, the family Camelidae, which comprises camels, llamas and others, originated in North America during the Middle Eocene period, at least 44 million years ago. Both the camel and horse families originated in the Americas and migrated into Eurasia via the Bering Strait. Modern camels are descended from the extinct genus Paracamelus, which probably crossed the Bering Land Bridge into Asia about 7.5 to 6.5 million years ago. The divergence between Paracamelus and Camelops occurred about 10 to 11 million years ago. Paracamelus would continue to live in North America as a high arctic camel until the middle Pleistocene. During Pleistocene warm periods, a smaller type of camelops inhabited Alaska and northern Yukon. These specimens date to about 50 to 45,000 years ago and seem to have disappeared from the area after this time, similar to the mastodon, the ground slot and the giant beaver. The skull of a Camelops specimen was found above the Glens Ferry Formation in present-day Idaho in a thick layer of coarse gravel known as the Tuana Gravels. Above this layer of gravel is another layer of fine river channel sands where the skull was found. The age of this fossil is as young as 2 million years old and perhaps even younger. During the late Oligocene and early Miocene periods, Camels apparently underwent swift evolutionary change, resulting in several, several genera with different anatomical structures, ranging from those with short limbs, those with gazelle-like bodies, and giraffe-like camels with long legs and long necks. This rich diversity decreased until only a few species, such as Camelops hesternus, remained in North America, before going extinct entirely around 11,000 years ago. By the end of the Pleistocene, Camelops was the only true camel remaining in North America, and possibly both Americas. Camelops extinction was part of a larger North American extinction in which native horses, mastodon and other megafauna also died out. Possible causal factors in this megafaunal extinction include global climate change, and hunting pressure from human beings. The mass extinction coincided roughly with the appearance of people belonging to the big game hunting Clovis culture, who were prolific hunters with distinct fluted stone tools, which allowed for a spear to be attached to a stone tool. Biochemical analysis have shown that Clovis tools were used in butchering camels. Because soft tissues are generally not well preserved in the fossil record, it is not certain if camelops possessed a hump, like modern camels, or lacked one, like modern llamas. 
because one humped camels are now known to have evolved from two humped camels. It would follow that Camelops, if it had humps, probably had two. Camelops was about 2.2 meters tall at the shoulder, making it slightly taller than modern Bactrian camels. It was also slightly heavier, weighing about 800 kgs. Plant remains found in the teeth of some Camelops fossils further reveal that rather than being limited to grazing, this species likely ate mixed species of plants, including coarse shrubs growing in coastal southern California. Camelops probably could travel long distances, similar to modern camel species. Whether or not Camelops could survive for long periods without water, as their extant camel cousins can, is still unknown. This may have been an adaptation that occurred much later, after camelids migrated to Asia and Africa. The last species of camelops are hypothesized to have disappeared as a result of the Blitzkrieg model. This model presents the hypothesis that camelops, along with other North American megafauna, disappeared as new cultures of experienced and efficient hunters moved southeastward across the continent. The result of this migration and expansion of human populations was a significant reduction in range for the megafauna. Of the many camelops specimens recovered in North America, mostly in the Wisconsin region, only a small number demonstrate modification through human actions. Some specimens have been interpreted as having been killed by humans based on the presence of spirally fractured bone fragments. None of the reported Camelops sites has been associated with stone tools, however, which would be an indicator of possible human use. At many of these Camelops sites, no fossils have been found of carcasses that were evidently processed, but rather small fragments and pieces of remains. Researchers originally thought that Camelops species were in fact hunted and butchered by early humans in North America because of these reasons the fragmenting of bones into shapes that look like tools, damage or weathering of the working edge of said tools, having attributes that were similar to making of chopping tools and scarred fragments from the possible chopping of tools. Further examination showed though that these assumptions were misguided and that while humans did coexist and associate with camelops, humans use has yet been completely proven as the sole cause of extinction. These giant Ice Age animals that roamed the earth during the Pleistocene Epoch were truly remarkable. From the massive wings of Argentavis to the imposing antlers of the giant Irish elk, these megafauna species captured the imagination of scientists and enthusiasts alike. Their sheer size, unique adaptations, and ecological roles made them fascinating subjects of study and contemplation. The extinction of these animals, whether it be due to climate change, human hunting or other factors, serves as a stark reminder of the fragility of life on Earth. It underscores the importance of understanding and preserving biodiversity to ensure the long-term health and stability of our planet's ecosystems. In the end, these ancient giants serve as a testament to the ever-changing and dynamic nature of our world, reminding us of the beauty and diversity that once graced our planet during the icy embrace of the Pleistocene Epoch. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.